Welcome everybody to the very first episode of the Wine and Comics Pairing Show. My name is Dave. And my name is Dallas. <laughs> That's a good start. We're too busy drinking wine to actually exactly. introduce the show. Today, we are going to uh, do a traditional first episode of what we think the show is going to be. We are each going to introduce a comic, and then we are each going to have to try and guess the best wine that the other has paired it with. You will find information for the comics and the wine that we will be showcasing in this episode in the description of this podcast or video, depending on which way you're consuming this. Um, all right, and without further ado... Let's wine, and at least one of us is probably going to wine. All right, so uh, should I do my comic first, or do you do you want to do first. yours first? I'm going to go first. You okay. First, but... So I chose Eddie Campbell's Bacchus. I thought this was a perfect uh, comic to put on our first episode. Yeah, Bacchus uh, is obviously the god of wine and revelry, also known as Dionysus. Um, this is by Eddie Campbell who is, um, and, and Bacchus is one of the great indie comic works that are, that's out there. Generally speaking, we're going to stick to the indies and the small press stuff, the self-published stuff, though that's where we think the greatest amount of creativity is happening, um, and that's the stuff that just really interests us, and that's stuff that we read. So uh, look for things like that, not so much big two. Um, back to Bacchus, this is considered one of the great indie works of art, um, Eddie Campbell, he was the artist on Alan Moore's From Hell, the same graphic novel that they uh, based, that, that the Johnny Depp movie was based on, um, for those of you who have seen the movie. Um, and then from there, he has two really uh, big works. He has one called Alec, A-L-E-C, which is a semi-autobiographical work that has also been collected into one giant omnibus tome like this. Um, and then Bacchus, his more long-running work, which has been collected in two omnibus tomes like this. Um, one of the really nifty, so not only is he the Greek god of wine, but one thing I really appreciate about these omnibuses, so Eddie Campbell himself has put into here, I'm going to see if this will show up on the camera, it does! He has pairings for every book that's in here. So from right here you can see it is a Old Vine Zinfandel from Sonoma County, which is such a gateway wine, you know, the kind of uh, dense, fruity, just gluggable, delicious wine that it gets you into wine in the first place, and that's great for book one of a, of a big, massive series. Um, and then it goes on. You get some Greek wines. You've got some, um, let's see, what Australian Petite Syrah. You've got an, uh, a sherry, uh, things of that nature. And I know by book two, he starts to pair it with some ale and some uh, scotch. Uh, so you kind of graduate up to the older and older and older. Um, so that's a lot of fun. Um, but the comic itself, so you follow along Bacchus, who in the modern day, um, he's been around for thousands of years. He's not what he used to be anymore. None of the gods are. He's now just kind of this old, wizened drunkard. Um, he is still immortal, and he, he is still more than human. Like, they're, they're, they are still gods, even if they're not as influential or able to do any major massive feats like they once did it's and it's not just Bacchus there are the other surviving gods and there are only a few both gods and other characters or creatures within the Greek pantheon um there I, I don't want to give too much away if you've never read the story before but you know it runs the gamut of just very small slice of life stories to um, to very pulpy, almost super heroic, not really quite, um, but a little bit action adventure especially when it comes to this character named the Eyeball Kid. Whenever he shows up, you know you're about to get into something a little more adventuresome. Um, the Eyeball Kid, who is this character right here, so he's got kind of ten sets of eyes. I blow him, <laughs> flicking people off. Is you guys, he's got like ten sets of eyes here. Um, one of, and one of them has been gouged out. You get the story of that. And he is a bit of a, he's a loony and kind of tragic character 
Um, he he was misabu- uh, He was abused by uh, Zeus back in the day, but he wound up. Yeah, this doesn't give away anything really important. He, he does wind up killing Zeus, taking his powers, and then there is a great cataclysm from that that stems from that act um, that wipes out most of the gods, so that only a handful really remain. Um, and we follow them. We so we follow Bacchus, and then we follow the others as well. There's an entire book, quote unquote, because the, there there are five smaller graphic novels contained in each of these omnibuses. So ten graphic novels total, and some of the graphic novels, each graphic novel kind of does its own thing. Um, so some of them are um, some of them are short are nothing but short stories, and they were inspired by when Eddie Campbell was really into like O. Henry short stories and things like that, and he was trying to in his hand and say like I wonder what I wonder what that would be like just in comics form. Um, and we can just use Bacchus sitting around in the bar talking with people and they, and you know, they regale him with stories. Uh, and so, and we'll just get some random stories. So it really it often does its own thing, but at the same time, it is a complete epic all together. So it's not just a bunch of random stuff and then you're done. It, it really does cohere, even though it marches to the beat of its own drum. And even though... Whatever you might expect from the narrative at any given point, it probably isn't going to do that. It's going to do something else. Um, so I, I adore these books so far. I finished all of Omnibus 1. Um, I'm two of five books in, uh, complete in Omnibus 2, so I have three more chapters to go uh, before I complete the entire series. But this is a great series to taken in in relatively small bursts like this is not something you want to marathon read um by any stretch of the imagination you you it was created over the course of i think of around maybe 20 25 years all told um done in little bits and pieces here and there and it i i think it works to read it like that like take it in small sips probably would be way too eclectic in just trying to do it in like a one or two or three sittings so like you really if you can do this in two two or three sittings I don't, god bless you but um Take it in small sips, uh, and so I paired it with a wine that was very similar. Should we? This is something we we didn't discuss beforehand. Um, and since the first episode, let's figure it out. Do we want to both do the comic first and then jump to the wine? And you want to talk about yours, or how do we want to do this? So curious. I'm gonna. I, so my rubric for this thing, right? Mm-hmm. I chose uh, a slightly different route. I decided to read something that's been in my to-read pile for far mm-hmm. too long. Mm-hmm. And uh, I picked up a number over the years. You and I would attend the... Um, I'm, 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 I'm answering your question. Uh, by doing it. <laughs> by doing it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, over the years, you and I would pop up at various comic book conventions and uh, exchanges and add to the pile. Sometimes we would add to the uh, agency pile. The other times we would add to the personal to read pile. And uh, over the years, that personal to read pile has gotten very large. Uh, And I decided to go back and find something I had not read, but wanted to. So we had all these things. We got damage, lots of issues of old DC damage. Don't, Don't scoff. No, 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 no. I love damage. <laughs> I liked that book a lot yeah. back in the day. Yes. Yeah, this is this is all damage, right? Um, nice. Lots of damage. <clears throat> but the thing I found was something I've been meaning to read for a long time because I have a crazy affinity for anthropomorphic uh, treatments and characters. Uh-huh. I, I hate that I do. I really, really hate that I am a frozen in time nine-year-old. I hate it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, (laughs) But I am. And what I chose, oh crap, where did I put it? Hold on, Ah, there we are. All right, we'll cut that out. Well, yeah, sure. (laughs) (laughs) Elephant Man. Oh yeah, you know what, I've never, actually read i don't think a single elephant man comic elephant man and uh it's curious because it's something i came across like i said at comic-con and uh grabbed it one of those days i think it was apple con when um was a big apple con when we were there um so it's written and created by richard starking 
Yeah, uh, yeah. he's yeah, he's the he's a British guy, but he's lived he's from Liverpool originally, but he's lived in the UK in uh, the US for right. quite a while. Right. He's run the Eisner, won the Eisner Award and all that crap. He's worked for Marvel, all this, all that stuff. He's got the pedigree. Right. Right. Um, but again, I have this insane affinity for uh, anthropomorphic treatments of characters. And again, I silently judge myself because of it. <laughs> I do. Yeah, it's um, it's curious because it has this weird mixture of being really rough, really, really rough at times, um, but also really poignant, really beautiful, and it, the sort of rising action is kind of all over the place at the beginning. It doesn't make sense, um, but everything comes together so seamlessly, and the characters are so poppy, and they appeal to that, you know, like I said, that kind of adolescent comic book fan that treatment there nor elements it's just a beautiful world i mean it's a fully realized world and generally that's the thing that draws me in is when a world is completely and fully realized yeah. even if it's not my cup of tea usually um right but uh no i'm not gonna say that Sorry, I'm editing myself in real time. Go on. <laughs> An Elephant Man, is it a... It's kind of futuristic sci-fi, but also a little bit like P.I. Noir. Absolutely. It's 200 years You're in the right? future. Yeah. So essentially, it's 200 years in the future. Um, this organization has, called Mapo, has created this human-animal hybrid using these sort of African women as... Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's got, there's some, <laughs> some things that haven't necessarily aged very well. Uh, <laughs> but, but possibly a little true to life in terms of, you know, the using, especially if it is a, a government or, or, I don't know if it's a private corporation that does this or, or a government organization, but, you know, you using, you know, marginalized, the, the absolute, right, marginalized yeah. there, that was the word I was looking for. Um, where, yeah, using or experimenting on them, like we, which has happened and has been documented unfortunately yeah. yeah um but it's it, it's just a beautiful world uh so it debuted in 2006 uh, the initial run was 16 issues i think 16 issues um but still kind of going on right it, like you know, something on. new it's, comes out like every once in a while right yeah it's still going um they were of course nicknamed the elephant men um it's 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 just a beautiful thing. I I hate that I like it is the issue. I really <laughs> have a hard time huh. admitting that I like this. But um, so what I did was I decided to actively pair wines with the chapters. Okay. Until yeah. I could narrow down something that fits the entire right um, piece Crazy. and. About two weeks ago, a week ago, I finally narrowed it down to three. <laughs> okay. And have further narrowed it down now to one. Um, so I will give you keywords, brutal, but it finishes very sweetly. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a rough world. It's a rough and tumble world. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so by brutal but finishes sweetly, do you are are you talking about almost like do you mean more of it, it's a lot to take at first sip, but then you know mellows out as you as as it continues to stay in your mouth slash out you know the the post the longer uh, the you sit yes the longer you sit with it the sweeter it becomes. So we, we, we should be able like, let's do one guess each. Okay. And, and I think this is something I, I've been thinking of as, as we're, as we're figuring out how we really want this game to go. So I think we each get one guess. And if that, if we don't get it in that guess, we do have to take a hint. We can't just okay. like guess let's go do 10 it. guesses in a row kind of a thing. Yeah, let's, um, do, let's do that. So just as a, a quick recap on yours outside of the astringent but it gets a little sweeter was there anything what else did you mention about it if there was anything else you mentioned about it you might not have. so uh i have the what should I... did you tell me yeah did you tell me the vintage what what uh oh 2019 for mine 2019. Today. i'm uh 2017 on this guy 2017 um 
and as far as it's it's meaty it is yeah very meaty. okay um, okay it, it is very meaty actually which is i'm gonna okay so i'm just gonna guess the the, the varietal of wine okay and and see if see i'm gonna take a stab uh oh. without so is it petite verdot no 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 okay that's yeah. usually my but meat, that is a, usually that's a too astringent. Guess. Right, so the wine for this one is, um, you know, it's a cult, it's a, or it was a cult winery uh, here in California. Um, it was. 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 Um, was. So uh, the first vintage was 1984, to give you kind of a timeline of it. And the winemaker, who, who is very experimental, which is why I think it pairs so well with an Eddie Campbell book, um, they're both known for kind of marching to a beat of their own drum. Um, okay. A lot of people in the industry, the wine or the comic industry, respectively. Um, they're both well respected, but everyone also thinks they're probably a little bit batty for for what they want to do um, and how they want to do it. And they're like, no one's going to respond to that. That's a terrible way to tell a story. Um, you know, Eddie Campbell, he had some co-writers on this book that that walked away because of the way he wanted to tell the story. And they're like, you can't do that. Like, it's a plot. It has to do things like in certain traditional ways or it doesn't work as a plot. And he was like, eh, that's boring. Let's just do it this other way. Um, and the winemaker is very much the same thing. Uh, he took a lot of traditional classical styles of wine um, from the old world. And here in California, decided he was going to recreate them, in, but also do them in ways that expressed the new world terroir, as they call it, um, mm -hmm. you know, the land of California and the kinds of grapes and the kinds of wines that grow here, but also still adhere to certain traditional styles, to certain classics, uh, but still do it his own way. Um, and a lot of people in the wine industry thought, I have always thought he was a maverick. I, he is very well respected now. He, he still is probably considered eccentric and or um, maybe a little batshit for for some of the things that he wants to do and likes to do but he seems to keep pulling them off um he's done uh he's done like solar aged wines that have uh done Ooh. like where you age them in the sun um so he's done he's experimented with that he's aged rosés that have have i actually have a, a couple of bottles in the fridge that are um, a, a, a fair number of years old rosé that he had mm. a sale on a case. So I got the whole case because it was one of the best rosés I ever tasted. And you're traditionally mm. not supposed to age rosés. They're meant to be very fresh, like the year, you know, the summer of. You buy them, you chill them, you drink them. Um, right. Maybe you can get away with a year or two, but four, yeah. five, six years, it, they're really not supposed to be, um, you know, you're not supposed to sell them for that long. Um, so... He was a cult winery. You had to be on, you had to have a membership. Um, you got like a new, and this was, you know, pre or, or pre-internet days. So, you know, mm -hmm. you had to get the newsletter, the magazine, the whatever it was uh -huh. that he would actually mail out. And then you ordered from that, um, whatever they had available. Um, and that has expanded over time. And then recently, and okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this. This isn't really part of a clue, per, part of one of the three clues that I might give you. So I'll go ahead and say this right now. Um, I think about two years ago, he sold the winery and he sold it to a big fund. Um, and he is still somewhat hands on at the winery. So he's still overseeing. Uh, and I, I, I know the vintage that I have here is still he's still called the winemaker of this vintage. Um, OK, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to reveal this part. So I got this bottle at BevMo. Okay. Go ahead. So, so it went it went from a cult winery where you had to, you know, you had to write in, get on a membership list, and that lasted two. well into the OOs, if not the tens. Um oh, and God. in just the in just the last couple of years, uh they are now in all the major like total beverage, Bevmo, starting with the twenty eighteen vintage. They started uh showing up there and the the exact uh this is the flagship wine of this winery. Right. This is like okay. the first one they put out. It's all, it's one they have every single year. Um, before they started showing up in places like BevMo and Total Beverage and before the 2018 vintage, it was, mm -hmm. I believe $35 a bottle to get this, the, the basic, they have a reserve version of the flagship 
and a basic. The reserve version, I think, was $45, um, and the basic was $35. And I bought this at BevMo for $14.99. Wow. And it is still just about, give or take, very small bit, as good. Because I've had, I've had the $35 and the $45 vintages as well. And it, they are still producing it in very much the same fashion um, with only a little bit of difference to it. So, yeah, a classic French blend. A classic French blend. Rosé. That is known uh, as a blank blend. And that's, that's, that's your that, – if you can guess that, you, 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 get, you get enough. I will count that as a win. Mm. Damn it, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> this version of that blend, and it, it's a little known, I actually had to look it up, um, because they've changed the blend ever so slightly for the 2018 and the 2019 when they when they started to show up in places like mm -hmm. Total Beverage and BevMo. And I looked up the rules on this blend because, as we all know, European wines are heavily regulated. That's kind of why, when you know where it's from, you almost know what's in the glass because you're only allowed to put X, Y, and Z into um, a such and such blend. So this is slightly altered from how they used to blend it, but it is part of the rules of the blend that you are allowed to blend it this way. So now the name of the blend is a bit of a misnomer because this version of the blend is technically not that, but you're allowed to do it this way and still be this style <laughs> and still be this style of blend. What? So anyway. <laughs> mm. Oh man. And it smells amazing. You know, it has a really and I mean this in a nice way. It has a very fungal smell. <laughs> okay. It has I mean you get this very just, you know, if you go to a section of the grocery store where there's all the root vegetables and the mushrooms yeah. and the things like that and it's all just like, and there's that little bit of that earthy but almost that yeah. nice like you can make yeah. this into something good. Minerally. You know, yeah, a little bit of minerally. And there is, I would say, fruit wise, the for this vintage at least, this is a twenty nineteen vintage, pomegranate is what you get more than anything else, but then also some raspberry strawberry to to mellow out that pomegranate. So I'm <laughs> so I'm gonna guess the class of wine. Uh, uh -huh. is it a move a That's not a blend. But oh. it is one of the grapes in this blend. So it is in the blend. Ah. Hold that. Hold the glass up to the light again. This this color is deceiving me. It is. It is. See if you can get the rim, because the rim kind of shows how light. Or let me try swirling it. You can kind of catch it when the light isn't just making it all opaque. You can see how like garnet red rather than dark red it is. Do you see that? Yeah, there's a very... It's very light burnout. strawberry red. It's not really yeah. this darkness that the light is making it look like right <laughs> here. And I will say the reason this is such a light-colored wine, it probably shouldn't be this lightly colored, but because they changed, mixed it up the way you're allowed to, but then makes the blend name a bit of a misnomer, there is a lighter grape in this than there should be or more of a lighter grape in this than there should be normally. Um, and that is, but it does make it, I mean, like I, I, I've mentioned that this is a very glug, glug, gluggable wine. And that's also a part of it is the, the grape they added into this that you're allowed to add into it in, in the quantity that they did is a really, it's usually a blending grape because of its very light body and it's very easy drinking. It, it rarely stands on its own. Um, though you can find it on its own when, when a, the vintage is good, when the harvest is good. Um, but it's usually a blending grape. And in this one, it really lightens it up because it's a, close to a third of the blend. Um, so, yeah. Close to a third. But it's not in the name of the blend. In the name of the blend, however, Mouvedre is. Kind of. <laughs> oh. No, there's no way it's that. Um, Dave. Yes. I think. I'm sweating. I've got this light up. Um, it's a hot day. 
You bastard. Ready for clue number two? Yes, of course. <laughs> All right. The winemaker, this cult winemaker, he has a nickname, the Roan Ranger. He even has an asteroid named after him called Roan Ranger. <laughs> so this is a Roan blend. It is the it is a, Roan Clearly. Blend. Yes. <laughs> it is the one and only, essentially, Roan blend that you're allowed to do. So, I have to pour myself another glass while I <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, go for it. So the only thing that comes to mind when you say Roan Ranger is... Is it Cigar Volant? Um, uh, it is? What? It is literally c Cigar Volant. That's the wine? That is the wine? <laughs> Ta-da! Bonnie Dune, oh my, Bonnie Dune, that's Bonnie the name of it. Bonnie Dune, Le Cigar uh, Volant. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this out yeah. because I love the story of why it's called C Le Cigar Volant. Yeah. Um, so in 1954, and this is, by the way, so it's the Rhone Ranger, specifically Chateauneuf du Pape is the right. place in Rhone, and it's, right. the GS, it's the GSM blend. It's the GSM, it's, it's the GSM, so Grenache, Syrah, Mouvedre is the GSM, was, and I was going to say it's a it's, it's an acronym of three letters, and I was like, there's only one, <laughs> there's no other. You know what's, you know what's crazy? That was what's my that? first guess, my very first guess, oh, was the well, GSM. But you didn't say it out loud, no. it was just in your head, no. yeah, yeah. Go with it. Uh, Go with your gut. Go with your gut next time. Uh, so it is the GSM. Now, this one specifically is they they actually, in the 2019 and the 2018, they took out the Mouvedre entirely. So Really? Why? Even though it's a GSM blend, and it has been since 1984, starting mm -hmm. with the 2018, they replaced the Mouvedre with Sinsol. Um, and that is a grape that when you look up the rules of Chateauneuf de Pop, you can the, – the only rule they have – Grenache has to be the majority of the blend. And then okay. from there, the next third, like the, the second most amount, can be either Syrah, Mouvedre, or Sinsol. And nobody thinks okay. about the Sinsol. I, di I didn't know that as a thing. I was like, no, but it's always GSM. No one, it's not right. GSC. Or whatever. In this case, it's GCS. Because it is since sold the second most and Syrah the last most. And it even has then 1% petite, uh, petite Syrah thrown in there as well, which you are allowed. In very small quantities, there are like 20 other grapes you can add to it, but only as like, I think, 10 to 20% max of all of them together. Okay. And the other 80, the other 80 or 90% must be GSM or C. And that C, nobody thinks of. So this is a, a GCS, no M. Um, Curious. Uh. As part of their the 2018 and 2019, they went big. They got bought out by a big company. Changed their label a little bit. Now, I did want to for everyone uh, out there, the, the the listeners and the viewers. Um, I want to read this little bit on the. Oh, and here we even have it's 56% Grenache, 30% Sinsol, mm. uh, Sinsol, and 13% Syrah, 1% Petit Syrah. Um, okay. So the story is in 1954, the mayor of Chateauneuf du Pop was quite perturbed and apprehensive that UFOs, or quote-unquote flying cigars, which is what Les Cigars Volant means, uh, might do damage to their vineyards. So, right-thinking men all, they passed a legal ordinance prohibiting such landings. The ordinance has worked well, as there has been no such landings since the adoption of this far-sighted legislation. The stellar composition of our Cigar Volant flying cigar contains, and then they tell you the blend. All right. But I love that story behind Le Cigar Volant, where it's like they that actually passed a law. It's probably still on the books to this day. Absolutely. Which is one of, which is one of those wonderful things where it's like, wait, I'm sorry, what? And it's like, <laughs> well, why remove it? It's like, we, in case any, if we ever do get visited by aliens, f that, we have a law. <laughs> we've had it since so, <laughs> 19, we've had it since 1954. Don't you dare. <laughs> exactly. So and so that's true. considered New World. Uh, whether you're talking about Australia, New Zealand. 
South Africa is the only one that sometimes can can be called old world. Um, I believe mm. there is there is debate over whether South Africa has, has been making wine long enough that that should be considered part of it. Um, but everywhere else that you can get wine is whether it's South America, whether it's um, New Zealand, Australia, whether it's the U.S., all yeah. of that. Hey, kitty. <laughs> 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 you were sweeping. Um, this is Kirara, everyone. Which, oh, if anyone who beautiful. reads Inuyasha manga will know who Kirara is, but he's a flame point Siamese. So I named him beautiful. after the flaming pod uh, Inuyasha cat, uh, Kirara. Nice. So, yeah. Uh, um, so that's why. So uh, when I thought of that, I knew Randall Graham, and then I thought his flagship because it was a GSM, and it was based on that Roan Chateauneuf de Pop tradition. I just thought, you know what? This is New World, Old World mashed together by an experimental Maverick winemaker creator, and I was like, that really just fits this um, better than even just going and getting an Old World wine. That wound right. up being that marriage of the two worlds, which this very much is. Because I like this. It. That's uh. That's a good pair. I, I, I see the rubric there. I see the, the logic. It's, that's good. That's good. All uh, right. Now so to... now you need to give me yours. All right. So as I said, I took a slightly different route. I decided to uh, pick up a comic I hadn't read, something I wanted to read. And through the reading of this comic, I realized a couple of things that it was really accessible. It's really accessible. Mm -hmm. It is, um, it's a typical sort of story of uh, these characters sort of homunculi, for lack of a better term, <laughs> you know, versions of homunculi. Right. Monkey, right. Um, you know, running loose 200 years in the future. It's based in California because that's where the writer was living uh, at the time he was writing it. Um, so it is filled with the ephemera, flora, fauna of Los Angeles, California, particularly Los ah. Angeles. As a matter of fact, Starkings was living in Santa Monica uh, when he was writing this piece. All um, right. And <laughs> so I decided to find a number of elements to sort of piece together and then use those elements to find wine that complemented or mirrored those things. So the first element, in the initial images of Elephant Men, he has this marquee of a Hooters. In, 20, in, the, in 200 years, there's still Hooters, of course, and uh, the Elephant Men are still, you know. <laughs> and it's not, it, I'm sorry, are the waitresses owls? <laughs> no, they okay. Really should be. <laughs> okay. It really should be. Um, and uh, so the first thing was Hooters. And the brand for me of Hooters, the iconography of Hooters, is very uniquely American, middle market. Um, you don't go there for anything other than ogling, oogling, and eating. Right. right. Um, so it's a very direct sort of... Uh, imagery. It's very accessible. Um, so I decided I would try to find an American wine because uh -huh. of that fact. An American wine that uh, paid homage to uh, Europe's sort of traditions, European okay. traditions. Okay. Not the older European traditions, but sort of contemporary European traditions of wine. Okay. Okay. Um, so now, initially, I was going Zinfandel. That's where I was going. I was going for Zin. But that seemed a bit too... I feel like it's hard when... to find, to bridge the gap between European and American Zin because yes. there's such, out of most grapes out there, probably Cabernet and Zin are the two that are just such different beasts between the yeah. two continents. Um, it's really hard, like even when people try and do the style of one in the other, the whole point is it grows so differently over Absolutely. here. Yeah. Absolutely, it grows so differently, the climate's just so different. But, um, so I, I initially was going with the Zin and I have a bottle of the Zin I initially paired with it here and uh, um, stuck with it for a while. 
I took a couple of nights, read the comic with it, uh -huh. and uh, didn't go anywhere. It didn't wow me. Didn't compliment the comic. The comic okay. didn't compliment yeah. the wine. Um, it didn't advance anything in the in the comic. And you were drinking so. and you were reading, but they were too. Exactly. You were just doing they both were at the so same time. <laughs> okay. So very disconnected. Uh, and initially, um, when I did try this in, I knew that it was just it just it was wrong. It was just wrong. So. My first hint, my second hint for you, I guess, you now is... Okay, yeah. uh, oh, wait, 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 I get to guess one more time before... You did say it's something that has a certain astringency that grows on you. It does. Its initial impact on the palate is, is mildly offensive. <laughs> It, it, okay, offensive is <laughs> a strong word. Offensive. Is I know, strong I know, word. but I, but I understand. I understand. It takes. It, it is one of those things. Like on the first sip, you're just like, okay, whoa, do I right. do I want to go back for another sip? It's perplexing. I, I, well, I bought the bottle. I better go back for another sip. I better right. make sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is initially perplexing on a tooth palate for sure, okay. for sure. And is it as as a as a question that hopefully and you know you can always choose not to answer it if you think it gives too much away, but as a question that should not double as a hint, um, is the kind of of grape or grapes plural if it's a blend? Is this is the astringency and is this is it something that is particular? at least in broad strokes, to what the wine is? Or is it just this particular version of that wine that seems to come across this way? It is particular to this particular wine. <laughs> okay. Vintage, yeah. Okay. That is... Okay, so... Okay, this is this is this is way out of left field, or I'm I'm just grasping at something. I have no idea how many California wineries even make this wine, but I'm gonna guess Sagrantino, which is an Italian grape, which is known, especially if you don't age it for like frickin' ten to twenty years, is too <laughs> much. Like it's it's wonderful if you age it that long, and it's hard right. to find a single varietal Sagrantino. Right. And they don't grow it much in Cal. They do grow a little bit in Cal. I found one winery that actually released a Sagrantino, and they don't even release one every year. It's like once in a great while. Um, okay. So that would be my guess from the from the sound of what you're what you're and the look on your face. I'm guessing nope. That was just stab in the dark. It was an attempt. <laughs> it's just a stab in the dark for sure. <laughs> but but not okay. a bad one because you you definitely picked up on the California thing. But. Um, that's simply where the artist was living when he was writing this. Um, okay. It was a bit of a misdirection. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So it's a mayor. It's someone. Oh, well, but I mean, the, the winery is California, right? No. Oh, no. I need to. So, so. What you wrote in the chat right there, my recording thing is covering it up. I can't read it. And I don't want to downsize. Okay. So can you just read that to me? The, yeah, the, the grapes are from the Dundee Hills, the yeah. Eola, Amity Hills, and the Yam Hill Carlton uh, counties. Yam Hill Carlton. I don't. And I know I've heard Enola Hills. That is something oh, yeah. I have You've seen definitely. on bottles before. Yeah. But that's not California, huh? So Enola huh. Hills is. And okay, well, I guess it's time for so I guessed I was wrong. It's time for clue number two. In 2013, this winery's uh, Jerusalem Hill Pinot was awarded the top American Pinot from the Decanter Awards at the Decanter Awards. Top American Pinot, huh? That's got to be okay. That's got to be Washington or Oregon if it's an award-winning Pinot, and it's not Oregon. California. It it's is Oregon. Oregon. Okay. All right. So, because that's those are the only two places that can do Pinot outside of California and make it work um, to date. It's Oregon. Um, okay. So Oregon, but this 
is, is it, but it's not a pino is it a pino it's not a pino you haven't said is it <laughs> <laughs> that was clue number two i feel like maybe that would give it away if you're like their their award-winning pino and it's like this is not the award-winning one but it is a pino <laughs> <laughs> and it takes some getting used to. It is not their award-winning Pinot. <laughs> um, and it is something thrown to the grape. Hmm. I don't think... I can't be a Pinot. Well, it could be a Pinot, actually, now that I think about it. Astringency, maybe. I mean, huh, that'd be a weird Pinot. It could just be a weird Pinot. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Pinots are usually such safe bets nine out of ten yeah. times. They really are. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they can be, some of them aren't very interesting, and some of them definitely yeah. are. And the interesting ones are, the, and by, but Pinots, when they're interesting, usually aren't still a risk. They're interesting in ways where they do nothing but get better. Um, it's, I've almost, sure. it's usually the boring Pinots that are bad because they're basic. Um, and you know, bad in that sense where it's like, this is, this is your gateway Pinot, but if you've moved beyond that, what are we doing here? You know, kind of a thing. Right. Um, so, um, it's a, a very dominant red cherry. Okay. Um, there's the, there's a lingering of a very light mint. Um, there's the, it's a. There's a creamy berry, and I haven't decided if it's like strawberry or what the berry is, but it's like okay. creamy mid palate berry thing. Okay. Um, very light tannins, kind of tobacco y. Okay. Um, um, and the finish is. The finish is. Uh, what the hell are gin and reds? Cranberry. All right, well, I'm going to throw, because I got nothing else right now, so I'm going to have to throw out, let's say, is it a Pinot? It is a Pinot. <laughs> Yay! I'm like, might as well. I got I literally fucking nothing else. Um, all right, so it's a Pinot. Yay! So that's that's one point to each of us. I froze again. I can see that. Okay, so I got the Pinot. So that's one point to each of us, because we each guessed right. without the third clue. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we did. Bravo. So. Round of applause. And um, so tell me a little bit more, though, about this wine. So it's a, it's a Pinot that – so what is it trying – like, what style is it trying is it trying to be as far as the winery is concerned? Like, what, what information did you have on that? Well, so the winery itself has started in the 80s. Um, they were right. – uh, the winemakers um, – were from Minnesota originally. They spent some time in Spain, in France, in Italy, studying wine when they were their kids. Came back, opened their um, the 42-acre hilltop little uh, winery or uh, organization, operation, um, and started digging deeply into the sparkling wine world. Um, oh, right. But then sort of uh, swipe that slate clean and decided to move into the Pinot space, the Noir space, you know, the um, the darker French uh, traditional right. grape. Um, Do you space. know where they, because a lot of sparkling wines are Pinot uh, sparkling wines. That tends to be the European tradition. It's Chardonnay and Pinot. Is that, yeah. did they literally just like, okay, we're making sparkling wine. We've been growing all this Pinot, but now it's Maybe it wasn't good enough for anything with sparkling wine before. Yeah, and that's then, kind of it. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, this is getting, now that we've been growing this for a little while, it's gotten better. Let's, let's, let's take it. That's kind of it. Yeah. It's kind of it. They've come back around to the, you know, to the white wines. And as of 2013, they have an exclusive white um, uh, line now, a reserve now that uh, is, is pretty popular. Uh, it's definitely gaining popularity for sure. Uh, cool. So are we ready for the reveal? Yes, please. Yeah. All right. Have it I is seen this before. Can I see? Domaine Serene. Yeah. No, I have. I don't think I've ever seen this one. Yeah. They are very uh, nice. From uh, yeah, Oregon. Okay. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what is what is? Do you know what makes this particular one so funky? 
It's a, so it's a, it's again, yeah, they call it their Yamhill Cuvée and you, you know what that, that is. It's yeah, a yeah. sort of for them. Yeah. Blend so of their best or, or supposedly their best. <laughs> yeah. Well, it means a couple of different things depending on, uh, you right, know, like right, the American right. version, you know, the, uh, but, uh, but it basically means a blend of, so it's not right. a P it's not like a Pinot from this very specific right. vineyard, but many vineyards in whatever the ABA. Yeah, right. You're, you're talking about and then other grape. interpretations are uh, that it's the initial grapes, the first grapes from oh, the new run. The you know what? I, grapes, I did not know grapes. that. Okay, yeah. interesting. Um, and I, th I think that's part of what makes it kind of kind of yeah. funky because it is really there's a bite. That initial bite is is something. <laughs> so when you say first grapes, it's like the first year that they've released from those vineyards those specific, that specific ABA or what have you well no I mean, generally I, I guess there are interpretations that, or do you mean uh, like young like right. the first grapes of the year the first harvest of the harvest of that the harvest. harvest okay of that harvest. okay um, gotcha but uh so younger yeah. not as ripe only certain le sugar levels and therefore certain exactly. yeah yeah and it's you're going to yeah. get more vegetal characteristics less fruit yeah yeah you are. Right. It, uh, it isn't as minerally as I thought it would be. Um, right. That initial bite from the cranberry and the um, the other berries is definitely tart. It's the tart thing. It's that initial tart, tartness yeah. Yeah. that slaps the yeah. tongue around a bit. Yeah. 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 Is there any? And, uh, and would you say there is any? Because I I don't know if this holds true for Pinot too much. Um, but usually when you pick grapes early before they're and sometimes some some grapes are early but they're ready that early yeah. depending on the varietal um but if you pick them before they're ready ready and just to try it out and see like well i wonder, I wonder what this will do i wonder what this will make right. um you usually get some kind of like when i say vegetal it's like a green pepper or like you know something where it's like more cucumber green pepper like that element yeah. that isn't really yeah. fruit forward it's that green vegetal characteristic that grow that you know ripens out of the grape as it continues to ripen yeah um, that's that's precisely what it is it's you know a, a sort of a, a parallel is the green banana versus the ripe banana green banana the yeah, difference that's good. in texture in sweetness and sugar yeah it's it's that yeah um yeah it did uh but but the longer you sit with it the the deeper it gets more satisfying it gets, and that is a perfect parallel for elephant lid, for sure. Awesome! <laughs> you know? I've got to read. Yeah. You know, I've been I've been wanting to read Elephant Men for for some time, just to check it out, just to at least try it. And I yeah. have not taken the plunge. Um, I believe they've released them in like omnibuses at this point because there's yeah, like that, enough absolutely. material out there. Um, so yeah, oh, I've got to I've got to check that out. You one of these days take the plunge into Bacchus. It is definitely worth it. going to take the plunge. Um, it is a commitment. <laughs> I think these are both like five hundred ish, five hundred fifty on Omnibus Two. Yeah, five hundred fifty ish, five hundred fifty wow. ish pages each. Um, and of course, we'll be uh, so. This is this is a good good place to wrap up here. So we're one point each. That's going to follow us into the next episode and all future episodes. We're going to keep trying to get better at this. Um, right. <laughs> maybe a little quicker and maybe a, a little easier to guess these things. I, I think we're so hesitant because we're just like, I don't know, we've never yeah. done this before. Um, My first guess was GSM. I, it was, I'm not kidding you. Yesterday. When well, we you know, I, I felt like this might be, I was trying, I was trying to do something interesting, but try and be a bit, it's first episode. I was like, don't make it too hard. Don't make it stupid. Yeah. Um, and I was trying and like, I, you just got a GSM from the blending lab the last time we met up. Yeah. And I was right. like, yeah, maybe, maybe he'll even have GSM on the mind. This will be perfect. Um, so I was trying to be a little softball -y with it, but at the yeah. same time, I mean, out of all the wine in the world, guessing a wine to pair with the comic, we have not made this easy on ourselves. We have we have chosen a challenge that is going to be a challenge every freaking time. But we'll see. Every like time. a year from now, like by episode fifty, let's see how we're doing. You know, and, and see see how we're doing. Um, this is this is a great thing to announce though. Uh, episode two, the plan is at least right now. We'll see what episode two actually becomes. But the plan is is we're going to do our first blind tasting. Um, it is called, we are calling this segment Baroque versus Bargain. 
and it is going to be an assembly of the exact same kind of wine from uh, Baroque or expensive. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to mix in some bargain, you know, Trader Joe's, 15 bucks and under versions of the exact same wine and see if we can taste the difference. And even if we can taste the difference, can we tell which is which? And which is exactly. our favorite, um, yeah. as well as deciding uh, what comic we're going to pair with our favorite of that blind tasting panel. So join us then. Um, Fantastic, guys. Yeah, that's it for now.